Um, so I, I promised, at least in the abstract, to talk about measurement techniques. And one of the things we did uh, several months ago is build a tool we call JPICO. And it's focused on a really simple thing. It's focused on showing whether or not your computer, and that includes the JVM, runs continuously. Because if the computer froze, there's nothing your application to do to run fast during that time. So we collect charts that look like this. We call them hiccup charts. Hiccup is just a cute word for jitter. Um, and, and here what you're seeing is an example of, you know, multi-hundred millisecond hiccups with the occasional multi-second hiccup. Young generation, old generation. It's just, I mean, it doesn't say that. It's just, you know, if you see a multi-second hiccup, that's an old check. If you see multi-hundred milliseconds and you don't have you know, 500 threads running there, you probably are looking at it, legit, especially when it's this periodic. And this is a percentile distribution of that. You see the best percentiles go for any percentile, you can figure out what the response time was. Now, this is not response time. This is JVM continuity. Now, the way to think about this is your response time can't be better than that because you're running on that, right? So if 99% of the time your JVM was better than 200 millisecond, that's fine, but if you know there's 1% where it was worse than 200 milliseconds in this load, which means your application couldn't possibly have 1% that's better than 200 milliseconds, or something's wrong with your tools, or something's wrong with JVM computers. Um, so that's the way to, to look at that. and, and um, yeah, this is an example of a telco app plotted against a, uh, an SLF. Uh, this is similar to before, right? Getting hiccups and such. Um, uh, so this is, uh, oh, just going to the anatomy of what's in here. Uh, this red line here is um, worst case over an interval, usually a five second interval. It's a, it's a useful way of looking at when the problem happens. <coughs> But this is more of the actual percentile distribution over time, which is the more useful way to look at SLAs, right? It's not when it happened wrong, it's what percent off it what, and you can plot your requirements on that pretty easily. This comes out of a spreadsheet in the tool, by the way. Um, but when we look at this, and compare it to how people typically think about response time, or classically think of response time, this, by the way, is from an IBM Kick server documentation that's about, I don't know, but this is a classic way we think about response time. We think that as we increase the load, response time will get slightly worse and then go bad. Because we know that you know, the computer can only go this fast and if you ask it to go faster, you're gonna wait in line. That's an intuitive thing. That's why this happens. But when you plot this, there's always the question of, well, what do you mean by response time? Are we talking about the average or the max or the median or the 99th percentile? And what do you mean by load, right? And is it really that response time is a function of load? Well, here's an example of a chart. By the way, I just went to the web, said response time charts, and downloaded stuff, and, and then put stuff on it. I'm lazy. Uh, the J hiccup stuff, I did. I, I, I actually made the charts. Um, this is an interesting graph from a load test. And, and um, the interesting thing about this graph, I don't know if the legend is easy to read, the response time is this black line that has spikes in it. And it's measured here in, I think that is in milliseconds over time. Again, this is a human response time application. But the interesting thing is this blue line is the concurrent user load. This is how many active users were in the system. And this is a load that grows the active users. If the response time was a function of load, you'd expect the black line to follow the blue line. So how does this translate into the uh, work of threads? Into the worker yeah, um, I actually don't. This is just a graph I took out of somebody else's book, so I don't know what their setup was. Right. I just I, I looked at the pattern specifically. So whatever uh, that means, right? Whatever, whatever yeah. user. Means. Yeah. Oh, and concurrent user in this case usually means you know they have some emulator of users hitting a web portal or a website. And they're doing some work with something time, and the more of them there are, the low, the higher the load, the higher the TPS will be, right? Uh, so you know you have updates and other things. The key thing is see how the response time varies dramatically, and here it is higher than here. 
This response time is really not a function of load. It's slightly a function of load, because you can see a trend going up here. But it is a lot more a function of time than it is a function of load, and it has these hiccups over time. And these are not there because you put more users on it. It's because you've been doing work, and it's, uh, and it's the, the, time is, the time has come to pay for that work. You're going to pause. And then you can keep going for a while, then you're going to pause. Then you're going to keep going for a while. And those hiccups are usually a, a result of accumulated problems that then get cleaned up for some reason. Right? Garbage collection looks like that. Right? And what you can do is a variation of load will vary the frequency, not the height. And the spikiness is not going away because it happens when it needs to happen. So um, jhiccup was actually designed as a tool for displaying these hiccups at the platform level, not the application level. And we really record the non-continuity of execution. Um, it's actually a very simple open source tool. It's running, it, you can actually run it with any Java application on any JVM and get these graphs. So I actually encourage people to do that to see what their, what their system behaves like right now. And it's public domain, not just open source. You can download it on a, on a site, and that means you can put it in your code if you want to and not worry about it. It's, it's really public domain. Um, so, this is what it measures. I, I got my slide order slightly wrong, I'm sorry about that. Um, and basically, it measures the platform, not the application, as I said. And, um, you know, the, the, it's actually very useful for control measurements, too. For example, while your application is running, run an idle workload on the same system with the J-hiccup. And if you see hiccups in the control and in your application at the same time, well, that's systemic hiccup. Right? Maybe the scheduler, maybe load, maybe power management. But if you see your application having hiccups and a control load at the same time not having hiccups, you know your JVM's at fault. Because the only thing be that's different between them is the JVM under load. Um, again, examples. I went through this already. In case I doubled up the slide. The way this thing works, by the way, is pretty silly. It's, it's less than a thousand lines of code, and all it does is Go to sleep for a millisecond, when it wakes up, it sees whether it's been long, longer than a millisecond before it woke, woke up, and it says, well, that was a hiccup, because it had nothing to do. And if I measured that if doing nothing took 500 milliseconds, that probably means that everybody took the same hit. Um, let's do some example charts with this. The first thing I ask people to do with a hiccup is not go measure their application, but go measure their system. So go run J hiccup on an idle. Linux system. And you'll typically see this. An idle system that does nothing has hiccups of 20 milliseconds in it. That's without tuning it well, right? And the reason I want people to do that, especially in your space, is if you go and start taking out Zane for a spin and measuring it, you'll come back and say, I saw 20 millisecond hiccups. Well, that's because your Linux system is running a cron job every 10 minutes and you know running a thousand threads and you know the scheduler makes me wait, right? So the, I, I don't know what the reason is, but you know you can see that there's noise in there. You need your idle noise to be below your target because I can't make that any better. Right? Yeah. Do, do you recommend tuning for the like we use Red Hat Linux to get there? Do you have special configuration of parameters for that? So we do, and mileage will vary, and there's a lot of what ifs, and it depends on what level you want to get to. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a slide at the end here that talks about levels to expect, but um, you know, this is an idle system, this is a busy system, busy meaning 25% busy, still 75% idle, but you have hiccups. Okay. This is just to show you that you know other people running on your system, threads running, spikes of threads, they can make this stuff happen, and that's a schedule on your job. There's no GC happening here. This is on what we call dedicated system that we tune. That's to show you that a regular Red Hat system with the right tuning can actually show a worst case of less than half a millisecond. Um, we haven't really spent the time to go much below that, but you could probably find all kinds of other tunings, and if you use other types of systems that are more you know, than just the generic systems, you could probably do better. So these are the worst case spikes you see. This is the distribution. And actually 50 microseconds is roughly the time in and out for the sleep call to wake up. So, you know, that's kind of the baseline here. So, pretty good percentiles as well. You kind of want your idle system to be like this before you start measuring other things. 
And if it's not like that, it should clean it up to a point where it's like that. It's a useful tool just to do the baseline. And then we can start running actual things on it. So this was just JVCup running an idle workload. So this would be a telco app. That's what I showed you before. Um, yeah. This actually was taken off of a, off of a pricing engine. Um, and, and, you know, whenever I see a graph like that, I'm very happy because Zing will bring that line completely down. You know, you show me a graph like this, I can solve your problem. Right? Um, so um, we can also use it to compare things, right? Not just to look at the problem. So we can compare different collectors, for example, or, or just different sizes in this case. So we have a four gigabyte cache on the left and a one gigabyte cache on the, on the right. And you can see that they both have spikes, but the spikes are different sizes. And yes, those are tens of thousands of milliseconds of spikes that are pretty rare. They only happen every 20 minutes, uh, but they're pretty painful when they happen. Or a different way to look at it is compare two collectors running the same mode. So parallel you see hotspot, this is not a thing, versus G1 on this side, right? Uh, G1 has this interesting pattern of having a lot more smaller pauses, right? And, and they're all in the hundreds of milliseconds. Um, but the real fun, and you know, I actually really like this quote. Um, Charles Nutter is the, the J Ruby guy, um, and, and this is what he tweeted about J Hiccup when it came out. Uh, it's a really cool tool, and he knows why we built it. Um, so let's 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 do that a little bit. And you see how much better Zing is on the left compared to Hotspot on the right? Can't you see that the, the spikes are much nicer? Well. I intentionally put that out there. It's hard to see the numbers. Um, that's 12 seconds, 14 seconds. That's 20 milliseconds. And if I normalize the graphs, they look like this. Okay, so that's the before after picture. Mm -hmm. and this is not, this is a regular Linux system where they trying to get rid of that. So we did no tuning. That noise level is the natural noise of an idle system. Right? Or that, that hasn't been, you know, tweaked to get below noise. So we can show that, which gives us a great tool to say, if you have this, we can do that too. 